why was it such a challenge and why was it so difficult to implement in hardware and in real code what Alan Turing had developed in, as a theoretical construct in 1936. The problem was that in, in Alan Turing's theoretical model, he has a black box which doesn't, is never explicitly, you know, it's not defined in engineering terms. And that black box can read and write uh, ones and zeros or punch holes or erase punched holes on a unlimited length of paper tape. But translating that into something that could work at useful electronic speeds was, was a tremendous challenge. And it's, it's in many ways a miracle that, it, that the problems were solved that quickly. Well, this was not the first computer. There were computers uh, before this point. There were electronic computers. What was new was that they needed a memory. They, and von Neumann's insight was to try and make the memory two-dimensional, whereas Alan Turing had, had proved his sort of mathematical points with a one-dimensional memory, with just a tape that runs back and forth. So how do we apply, you know, how do we learn something from this sort of marvelous example of these essentially 12 people, you know, who got together in 1945 and changed the world so much, probably for the better, although they also helped develop the hydrogen bomb maybe for, for, for worse, but I think generally the results were good. The lesson to take from that, in my view, is uh, you know, let these small imaginative groups of people do, do what they want. Don't get in their way. What was surprising was that we had at that time, we had lots of great laboratories, particularly after World War II. We had Bell Labs. We had MIT had huge electronic computation laboratories. There was a big computing lab at Harvard. There was laboratories at Chicago, Los Alamos, um, General Electric, RCA, yet here in this strange place in Princeton, there was nowhere to even plug in a soldering gun. They had to wire their own plugs to, to plug in their tools to build the workbenches to start working on. And in some way, I think that's why they were so creative, because they were working completely in a vacuum. You see all too often that, okay, we're going to do this, you know, we want to solve these problems in genetics or something, let's build a big enormous laboratory that costs $500 million and you know the building is so beautiful people won't want to go home and, and then nothing happens. Uh, very often the most creative things happen in the most implausible places. Mm -hmm.